I'm going to in introduce um, our um, first uh, speaker, um, direct hot from a uh, new position at the, the, the Equality Trust. Really excited um, to have, um, uh, to welcome uh, Dr. Zabeda Hike, um, new executive director of the Equality Trust. So over to you, Zabeda. Hello, everybody. Um... It's lovely to have you here. It's seven o'clock on Monday evening. So um, considering it's Monday evening, considering there's a bit going on politically, um, so to speak, I, you know, we are honoured to have you here. Um, and it's a real privilege for me to be here as well, um, not just to talk to you, but also as the newly appointed executive director of the Equality Trust. Um, now, I've been asked to speak about health inequalities, um, partly because of, you know, obviously because I'm from the Equality Trust, but also because um, I'm a member of Independent Sage. And I don't know if you know about Independent Sage, but we were set up very soon after the pandemic kicked off, partly because um, we were somewhat dismayed by how the government was already approaching this pandemic how we felt that they weren't transparent with the data and how we felt that they were not taking into account everybody. Now, I'm a, I'm a member of the independent stage from the perspective of inequalities. We realized very quickly that inequalities wasn't going to be considered in the pandemic. And we thought it was quite critical that we needed to take account of the pandemic. And here we are, um of inequalities and here we are two years later we were only hoping to have independent sage we were only thinking that we'd be needed for a month or two but here we are two years later and we're still around um now two years ago it would have been very hard it would have been very hard for me to talk about health inequalities not because it didn't exist i think most of us know that health inequalities was very much a feature of our society um, in the uk two years ago we knew the marmot review has been around for decades we were acutely conscious of what was happening you know, with health inequalities in terms of life expectancies in terms of um, what was happening to people from different socioeconomic backgrounds and so on. But the reason I say two years ago, it would have been very difficult is because we hadn't seen just how devastating health inequalities could be. We were always led to believe that health inequalities was a slight disparity in your health outcomes. It was about, for instance, access to healthcare and that you didn't necessarily have the same access to healthcare um, or your quality of healthcare wasn't as good or the um, who you saw and when, how long you waited. We were always led to believe that that's what health inequalities meant. But of course, the pandemic changed our conception of that. It shone not just a light on health inequalities, but it made us realize that health inequalities and if you like, all the other structural inequalities which were interrelated, which were interwoven with health inequalities was the difference between severe illness or mild infection or more devastatingly life and death. Health inequalities and socioeconomic inequalities was a matter of life and death. And we learned that, we learned that in very devastating ways in the pandemic. And it's not history. We're still in the pandemic. We still can see that where you live, the type of housing that you live in, the type of job that you do, whether you travel on public transport or not, how much you earn, whether you can afford to self-isolate or not, all of the issues, all of these issues determine whether you fall very ill with the virus or whether you live or die with this virus. And in that sense, we learned something new about health inequalities. Um, I suppose the other thing I would say, and something I guess which is obvious, but I don't think is said enough, is that health qualities isn't just about individual responsibility. I found it really interesting 
at the beginning of the pandemic, um, when Boris Johnson turned around, especially after he'd been hospitalized and said that actually one of the things we needed to do was tackle obesity. And then of course the government's policy was very much around how individuals could take responsibility for obesity. But I think the one thing that needs to be understood and isn't said enough about health inequalities is it's not just about health individual responsibility. In fact, it could be argued it's very little to do with individual responsibility. Most of it, most of it is structural and systemic, and most of it is to do with the wider determinants in society. It's to do with, as I've mentioned, the type of house that you live in, the type of job that you do, how much you earn, whether you tra travel on public transport, all of these issues, all of these issues determines health inequalities and green space. We hardly ever talk about green space, but one of the times where I realized how important it was, was during, of course, the really long lockdowns, when we had people on independent stage coming on, telling us, sharing with us their stories about the lack of access to green space. And that was highly correlated to overcrowded housing, that was highly related to poverty and deprivation, it's highly correlated to whether you lived in a flat or not. But green space is one of those fundamental issues, highly correlated to health inequalities, that we don't talk about. Now, I'm conscious that we don't have much time, so I'll just move on. But one of the things I want to, one of the other things I want to talk about is this whole notion that we're hearing it at the moment about excuse me, about returning to normal and what normal looks like and whether normal was good. And actually at the Equality Trust, we're trying to turn that on its head. It's not just us. I think, I think generally speaking, everybody is asking the question and the right question, you know, what kind of normal do we want to return to? And I think it's very clear to us that the old normal wasn't good enough in terms of health inequalities, that accepting that vulnerable people needed to shield, that accepting the high number of deaths from flu, that accepting that you were much more likely to have diabetes, to have coronary heart disease, to be much more vulnerable to certain and devastating health or illnesses because of your background characteristics was just not acceptable. It's not acceptable. And I think now we've realized that we don't need to return to that old normal. But the other thing I would challenge is that at the moment, much of the emphasis is on, um, much of the emphasis is on, you know, the treatment delays, the treatment delays due to NHS pressure. And of course, around the long-term physical and mental health consequences of being in a pandemic for two years. And, and that's right. I think that's absolutely right. We should be talking about those issues. But I suppose from my perspective, from Independent Sage's perspective, from the Call to Trust perspective, the bigger questions really are around what about all, what about all the factors that caused our health inequalities? Because if we don't deal with those factors, if we don't deal with the inconsistent childcare during the pandemic, the lack of access to education, the lack of access to good quality care, the issues around, for instance, how black women, black pregnant women were overlooked during the pandemic. But of course their voices weren't heard even before the pandemic. If we don't deal with all those issues now, or actually the other issue is around how you were less cared for if you were self-employed, you were less cared for if you were on benefits. If we don't deal with those issues now, then we will go straight back to where we were in terms of pre-existing health, um, in terms of pre-existing health inequalities. I know, Emma, sorry, I'm going way over my time, but the last thing I want to say is around this, is, is that it's clear that in terms of tackling the causes and consequences of health inequalities, we can't have there's no single, there's no single answer, there's no magic bullet, but it's going to have to be a mix of interventions, a mix of approaches, but more importantly, it will have to be both local and national. 
and I won't talk about what we can do nationally. There's lots of things we should be doing nationally. I'm going to talk just a little bit about what we could be doing locally. And I know we're going to talk a lot more about that, but locally, I think it's about what we can do on, on day to day. It's, it's about what we can do in terms of making health inequalities everybody's business so i sat there and i brainstormed a little today about you know what does that look like what does that mean and i thought well actually if we think about the pandemic and if we think about health inequalities some of the really obvious issues was around as i mentioned good quality green spaces but accessible green spaces it was fundamentally wrong and there is research showing that if you live in a more deprived neighbourhood, if you live in blocks of flats, if you live around council housing, there is less green space. And actually, it's not just about lockdown. Green space is good for our health, our well-being, our mental health and so on. So it's about good designing good quality green spaces. It's about access to affordable and healthy food. It's about transport. You know, having transport that's accessible, that is designed to take into account complex needs, about affordable transport. It's about affordable housing and about building housing that can fit larger families. Overcrowded housing was one of the worst risk factors in this pandemic. That if you lived in overcrowded housing and if you lived in deprived areas, you were significantly not much more, not just much more likely to be infected with the virus, but significantly more likely to be hospitalized and to die with the virus. And that frankly is unacceptable. It's also about fuel poverty, issues around fuel poverty and poverty as well, which will become much more important in the next couple of months as the cost of living crisis hits us, as energy prices soar, as the cost of food increases, as benefit cuts, as the benefit cuts, the 20 pound uplift to universal credit is, is, is taken, is peeled back. As national insurance kicks in, we will have the perfect storm, perfect storm to not only amplify health inequalities, but make them much worse. And I think last but not least, it's also about ensuring, and this is something we feel very strongly about at the Equality Trust, it's also about ensuring that those who are the most vulnerable, that those who are at risk, who are marginalised, whose voices are harder to reach, it's about ensuring that those voices are connected to the local policymakers, that those voices are amplified, that those lived experiences, and they we have very, very, very diverse lived experiences, that they are all brought to the fore in terms of local policymaking, that we don't leave it to them to have to navigate the system, that those who are in those who are involved in policymaking, that the local stakeholders from local authorities to local partnerships all of those groups reach out to those vulnerable groups and marginalized groups and if you like lift them up so that they are able to use their voice so that their so that their voices are heard um i was going to talk a lot more about everyday examples of health inequalities but i think my fellow speakers um We'll be talking about that and I'll just stop there. I'm sorry, I did go a little bit over, but I just want to say thank you for having me on. Thank you ever so much, Zubeda, and, and really appreciate you being here tonight as well, especially. So, so thank you for that. Um, I'm going to pass on if um, uh, to Tafumi, um, or do um from Blam. Um, she's going to be talking about um, uh, mental health um, and the black community um, and I'll, I'll let her um, introduce herself and, and Blam. Sorry, my computer is frozen a bit and 
someone has put washing on as well. So you might be able to hear that a bit in the background. Um, so while I get my um, screen share together, I'm, my name is Tafumi Odubemi. I'm the lead project worker and project manager at BLAM UK. Um, BLAM stands for Black Learning Achievement and Mental Health. We work on a number of different initiatives, um, but our kind of main priority is education and um, kind of looking at it through a so-called intersectional lens by understanding that mental health outcomes play an important role in educational outcomes of um, young Black children and then kind of extending it from there onwards. So I'm going to talk a little bit about basically Black mental health in the UK and some successful campaigns around that. I think everyone should be able to see the screen. Let me know if you cannot. Thank you, Emma. Um, awesome, fantastic. So today um, we'll ideally talk about three things, how mental health services in the UK are not really appropriate, they're inappropriate to the needs of the Black community, of Black communities, showcase um, what we, the model that we use for appropriately meeting that community need, and then also um, celebrating campaigning efforts that have began to change the mental health landscape for Black individuals in the UK, particularly Shenny's Law. So as um, Dr. Um, Zubaida has kind of well noted is that COVID has obviously led to a mental health crisis. Um, recent statistics show um, as of summer 2021, one in six adults experienced some form of depression. Um, however, this crisis obviously affects different people in the UK in more severe ways because of the structural and institutionalized racism um, that exists, ethnic minorities in general and members of Black communities in particular are more affected and have been disproportionately affected by the pandemic um, in the following ways, all which are linked to poor mental health. They disproportionately have um, low income jobs or have lost income and jobs throughout the pandemic. They've suffered far higher rates of COVID related illness and death, and they have disproportionately been criminalized throughout the pandemic. The fact that health services in the UK are inappropriate to the needs of Black people compounds the situation, hindering the kind of so-called recovery and return to quote unquote normal life, which obviously needs to be reimagined um, as, as a result of services not really meeting those needs. So what are the gaps and failures in service provisions for Black communities? Before we get into that, I quickly want to touch on why this gap exists, and it exists because of racial trauma. Longitudinal studies have shown and demonstrate that exper experiences of racial discrimination predate poor health. Changes in racial discrimination are associated with changes in mental health. Chronic exposure to everyday racial discrimination is associated with poor sleep, coronary artery calcification, altered um, diurnal cortisol patterns, and higher cortisol awakening response. So that basically means you feel stressed a lot more so that the cortisol levels in your body are higher, which that compounding over time can result in other elements like your heart, your kidney, your liver, and so forth, not actually beginning to deteriorate much more quickly over time, simply because you live in a racist society. So that kind of accumulation to, of exposure to racial discrimination over time is ultimately increased with morbidity. So it's simply said Black community members are at an increased risk of early death and poor aging as a result of experiences of living in a system where institutional racism prevails. So then linking it to mental health services is the reality is that existing mental health service provisions are inadequate for two key reasons. They are Eurocentric in their approach. Everyone who, you know, kind of studies psychology is still being taught about Freud, but that's not a conversation for another day. Um, there is unfortunately also racism within mental health in general and psychotherapy in particular. This breaks down into many elements um, from the ways in which 
uh, a therapist might go about in dealing with therapy to talking therapy not necessarily being appropriate a black person doesn't necessarily want to talk about their racial trauma to a white therapist who is not going to understand that experience in the same way that a black therapist may because the black therapist likely has that life experience um, so dealing with the first the eurocentric approach um, the kind of Eurocentricity of mental health service and failure to consider the historical and socio-political realities of Blackness in the UK have been the cause of criticism for decades. Traditional Eurocentric counseling and psychology is not equipped to support recovery from trauma that Black people have and continue to experience, including racial trauma. One of the reasons for this is the fact that Eurocentric psychology situated white middle class heterosexual men as the standard for scientific study, resulting in theories developed around the self that cannot really be expected to apply to everyone. In African centered psychology, though, mental disorder does not refer solely to the individual intrapsychic malfunction. So Eurocentric therapy tends to say, look inwards, look inwards, look inwards, what's going on with you on the inside, but African-centric psychology tries to look at larger, a larger context, so it looks at larger context of both the social and political reality of the person. Mental health is then defined by that which promotes the survival and the liberation of people of African descent, both individually and collectively brought to the fore in a richer matrix within which to conceptualize and treat dysfunctional behavior. So it takes it from being an internal individual process of healing and learning to being one of communal healing and learning. Moving then to the kind of history of racism within um, kind of the actual ways in which um, a therapist might interact is there is a long history of racism in the field of psychology. Um, in 1913, Evers argued that slavery was in fact beneficial to Africans because imitating European slave owners ameliorated their lacking mental initiative. This quote unquote scientific view was consonant with the social mores at the time, which saw Africans as more animal than human. A few years prior to the publication of this paper, Africans from the continent were being displayed at the St. Louis World Fairs with monkeys. As recently as 1973, a gentleman named um, Henry Garrett, a past president of the American Psychology Psychological Association stated that the black man's brain is on average smaller and less complex than those of white people. This was given as supporting evidence against racial integration. So at its very core, psychology does have an incredibly problematic and very racist past. And that's why it comes as no surprise that it would then fail to meet the needs of um, the black community because this is what people learn in school and the trainings that they do when on the pathway to becoming a therapist or counselor or a psychologist or a psychiatrist. Moving then to um, what we like to do at BLAM is we have something called our Zuri Wellness, Racial Wellness Workshops. And our workshops are shaped and informed by African-centered psychology as described previously. So they encourage a contemplative practice that is oriented by soulfulness which is in turn characterized by themes emerging from diasporic African cultural influences and inspired by African American cultural senses, sensibility. So these themes include an ethos of interconnectedness, a relational slash communal sensibility, the centrality of spirituality, creativity and improvisation, and um, a more kind of holistic orientation of human experience, emotional expressiveness, resilience, and overcoming adversity and struggles for liberation in the context of historical and ongoing dehumanization. So that's kind of how we like to, and we go about our therapy. It's not just talking therapy. It's not just cognitive behavioral therapy. It's very much a holistic approach that, um, looks both inwards communal and then incorporates different ways of kind of trying to learn how to express oneself. But a really key aspect of our workshops too is that they're free of charge, which makes them ultimately accessible to those most in need. Um, in the UK, therapy to an extent is available free of charge, but there are caveats with that. Um, and then we all know the realities of the NHS. <clears throat> Moving finally then to modern campaigning efforts. Um, is that 
Um, there is a law that's coming into force March of this year called Seni's Law, and um, it is a law that has come to fore because of a, a young man who had um, mental health issues, um, Olasheni Lewis, and was detained by police officers in um, a hospital and ended up dying as a result of that prolonged restraint and detention. The reality is, and why this campaign is such a success, is the reality is that Black individuals with mental illness, um, particularly Black men, are more likely to be detained under the Mental Health Act, are more likely to be violently detained in the process. So when the police are now called into that situation, for, that, for them to be detained, it tends to be much more violently done than what would be done to their white counterparts. And they're also more likely to be detained for much, much longer. So as a white individual who expresses the same level of mental illness might only be detained for three months, black individual could be detained for years and years and years. And, 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 and their family could try to step in and not be able to do that. So that is kind of the reality that we need to also understand and re realize that mental health systems in the UK, particularly around detention, are actually very closely interconnected with the carceral system of the state. And the carceral system of the state ultimately likes to imprison and lock up Black people. I was meant to leave it on a positive note. This is a very positive law that um, now there are um, limitations to how um, and people are not meant to be restrained in particular ways, but still this is not perfect you shouldn't be restraining other human beings period so you know there's kind of room to grow so that's basically my presentation these are some of the things other things that we do at blam um definitely do feel free to visit our website if you're on social media check that out and you can contact myself or tabby we both work um on the kind of racial wellness aspects of the organization so thank you very much everyone Thank you so much, Defumi, for that that um, really powerful um, presentation. Um, I'm just conscious of of time, and I know Zubeda has to go at um, uh, quarter two. So um, apologies, Paul. I know we we said um, we do do the presentations one after the other, but I just wanted to give. Um, people the opportunity um, if they did have any questions to ask Zubeda um, before um, I pass on to Paul so um, because I know Paul's presentation will be about 15 minutes um, so um, so if, if I'll just want to see if there are any questions um, before I pass on to Paul. No, okay, right. Oh, I've, I've given. Oh no, sorry, Kirit um, has has a hand up there. Kirit, camera's a bit off. Can you hear me properly? Yes, I can now. Yes. Oh, great. Sorry. Um, thanks. Yeah, my name is Kirit Mystery. I'm, I kind of run a small charity called South Asian Health Action, but I also work for Race on the Agenda. Um, one of the things that you know wanted to kind of, and I, we were involved. We we set up a equality trust group many years ago in Derby so we are still kind of active but not been active for about five six years question really Zabedo is it's good to see that you're in there you've taken over there and you know one, one of the things that based on the last presentation from Tofumi is there a kind of a, a, a focus around mental health that the trust are looking at doing and the reason why I asked the question is we've seen um, if we look at the national mental health charities right they've benefited over the last 18 months on, on the Black George Floyd agenda. And for historically, they've really failed black communities, you know, in terms of race, race equality and mental health. So, and I was involved in the Delivery Race Equality Program many years ago as well. So one of the things that we need to do is how can Equality Trust, Rotor and other kind of race specific organizations reclaim the agenda around mental health and black communities? Because I think unless we do that, we're going to still see the same poor services that are going to be continue to be delivered and our community is going to suffer as a result so it's not a question for today but it's something that we need to kind of strategize 
and look at how we claim reclaim the agenda um, as race is back on the agenda we need to keep it on the agenda but mental health is definitely something that we need to reclaim well, uh, thank you thank you Kirit very much for your question and Paul thank you so much we're waiting for your presentation I'm so sorry I, I have to leave early um, so thank you for being so accommodating Kirit it is a really important question and I really enjoyed and and um, sort of really empathize with Tafumi's presentation because um, years ago Years ago, actually, for about two years, I worked on um, I worked on deaths in custody for the government, and um, I worked very closely with Sir Toby Harris, who was in charge of the Independent Advisory Group on Deaths in Custody. And, and one of my jobs was to look at and to analyse who exactly was dying um, in custody, and it was one of those tragic facts that we had a disproportionate number of deaths of people with mental health issues. And of those people with mental health issues, there were also a large number of black people. And it was specifically black people um, who were much more disproportionately likely to die in deaths in custody with mental health issues. So I won't talk much more about Tafumi's presentation. I think it spoke loudly. Uh, but first of all, I want to say that it is a positive thing, but it was hard. It was hard to get Olisena's law. And it was a tragic, it was tragic that it took the death of people like Olisena Lewis um, to get to that point in the law where we actually had to say, you shouldn't be restraining people for so long when they have mental health issues. In terms of the race issue, Kirit, you're absolutely right. I mean, there's no question that when it comes to health inequalities, and we saw it in the pandemic, that's why I was saying that it's, it's a very strange thing about the pandemic, that on the one hand, it's been devastating for so many of us in terms of what's happened in the pandemic. But on the other hand, and I don't know how else to say it, we should see this as an opportunity for what we've learned and what that means about what we can do. But there's no question that black and ethnic minority groups because of systemic inequalities, because of structural inequalities that existed even before the pandemic, that they were going to be much more likely to be affected detrimentally by the pandemic and because of the, of, of the circumstances they lived in. But here's the thing, Kirit, it's not just black and ethnic minority groups. One of the things we always forget was one of the reasons that black and ethnic minority groups were much more vulnerable was because of their socioeconomic circumstances. We know that black people, black and ethnic minority people are two times more likely to be in poverty. That really mattered in this pandemic. We know that BME people weren't more likely to die or be severely hospitalized because of their biology. It was because of the circumstances they lived in. So my answer is, first of all, we shouldn't be categorizing issues in terms of race, in terms of class. Race and class are inextricably intertwined. What we should be recognizing is what it is about people's backgrounds that have made them much more vulnerable. What it is, what is it about people's backgrounds that means that they are less heard, that means that they are less likely to get access to good quality treatment, that means that they are overlooked, that means they are restrained for a very long time, that means that they, that their pain isn't heard. You know, what is it about their circumstances? So in terms of the Equality Trust, um, first of all, I don't think this is just an issue for us and race equality organisations, although those alliances will exist and be hopefully further improved because I come from, um, you know, I, as, as the former interim director of Run Amid Trust, which is a race quality think tank. I think it's about alliances between those groups, but I think it's also about what we at Equality Trust fundamentally believe, which is it's about amplifying the voices of those who are not heard. It's about bringing those voices and connecting them to the policy makers, connecting them to those who make the decisions. Um, and it's ensuring that those lived experiences are shared and amplified. Um, and it's about the alliances. So I would like to see a lot more alliances, I think, with the mental health 
um, organizations out there. Uh, but I think you're right, Kirit. It is about ensuring, it is about ensuring that once again, black and ethnic minority voices, those from poorer backgrounds, those who are more at risk, those who are more hard to reach, that their voices are no longer ignored. Thank you, Zubaida. And, and many thanks um, to Paul as well for being patient. Sorry to just uh, just uh, throw that on you. Um, OK, so I'm, I'm going to um, pass over to Paul now um, uh, from MenCap. Um, and um, he's going to, to talk a bit um, about cam campaigning around um, health and learning disabilities. Hi, and, and no worries at all. I am absolutely fine about <laughs> changing the schedule. That's absolutely fine. Um, so thank you for having me this evening. I really appreciate it. I've got a, I've got a presentation that I'm going to attempt to put up. There we go. So I'll be talking for about 15, 15 minutes, and I'm hoping we'll have some time for, for questions at the end. So just a bit of background about MENCAP. So MENCAP is a, is a learning disability charity, and um, we exist to address uh, the inequalities and systemic barriers that people with learning disabilities face in the UK, and we also provide um, services for people with learning disabilities. So that's a little bit about our kind of mission. And I'm here to talk about our uh, work to influence, specifically influence health policies. So our work on, on health and health has been a real focus for us for the last five years. Um, and the reason for that is that people with learning disabilities face uh, shocking health inequalities. So this is just a, 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 a brief summary of some of the health inequalities that people with learning disabilities face. Um, so 1,200 uh, people with learning disabilities die avoidably every, every year. Um, and the uh, age, uh, average age at which um, somebody from a learning disability uh, dies is much younger than the average uh, for the rest of the population. So, um, and this is because uh, people with learning disabilities face barriers to, uh, to healthcare. So they uh, face barriers in terms of attitudes of healthcare staff, but also practically in terms of um, reasonable adjustments, for example, um, not being made, a lack of communication, lack of accessible information, um, a, a lack of um, clear um, language. So those are all barriers um, that people with learning disabilities face in healthcare. So in back in August 27, as I said, I'm going to talk about the last five years of our campaigning around health. So I'm going to start and go back to, to right at the beginning to August 2017. Um, when we launched uh, Treat Me Well, our Treat Me Well campaign aimed to um, uh, address those inequalities that people with learning disabilities face in the healthcare system and to transform the way the NHS treats people with learning disabilities. The focus of Treat Me Well was very much on secondary care, um, so on, on, on hospital treatment. Um, because that's where uh, we felt our resources were best focused. Um, but as we will go on to see, there were issues also around, around uh, primary care as well, which, which we went on to address later as part of the campaign and as part of our, um, our campaign to address issues around COVID. So, Treat Me Well, we recently carried out an evaluation of our Treat Me Well campaign and um, it was confirmed and it was an independent evaluation. So we had it carried out by uh, uh, two independent evaluators and they confirmed in that evaluation that two policymakers had confirmed that the campaign had contributed to lasting systemic change. That's quite a big uh, kind of achievement for, for, for any campaign to get um, 
to get confirmation like that from from decision makers. So it it did cut through in terms of um, in terms of influencing uh, policy and health policy, um, which is which is a, which is a big achievement for for us and for our campaign. And the campaign was split into four strands. So we had a, a, a local element um, where we set up or helped groups set up. So those were people with lived experience, people with learning disabilities, healthcare professionals, organize, local organizations. And we set up local groups to campaign in their local hospital trust um, around reasonable adjustments and uh, challenging uh, bad practice within, within those trusts. We empowered people with learning disabilities to speak up for their rights, um, to uh, uh, kind of advocate um, and to challenge uh, bad practice. Uh, uh, the third strand of the campaign was to change the attitudes of healthcare workers, a behavior change uh, strand, which aimed to uh, create advocates within hospitals for, for people with learning disabilities amongst the staff. And then the fourth strand was our national policy ask, which was uh, a call for the government to make mandatory learning disability awareness training, uh, learning disability awareness training mandatory for all NHS staff. So I'm gonna just focus down on, on, on that particular ask. Um, and the mandatory training ask uh, was successful because uh, we built relationships with key policymakers. So we we were very much respected by decision makers, by the government uh, within the Department of Health and Social Care, uh, by key policymakers within NHS England and other health bodies, including the Royal College of Nurses, for example. Um, and we built that reputation up through our knowledge and our strategic approach. Um, and we had been campaigning for many years on health. So we'd gathered quite a, a data bank on the health inequalities that people faced. Um, and we used that in order to engage policymakers in, in, in the issues that people with learning disabilities face. We worked with a family campaigner, uh, Pauline McGowan, who led the campaign for mandatory training. And she was a real advocate. She was a mother whose son had died in hospital um, from being given medication that he was uh, uh, allergic to. Um, and Paula uh, set up uh, the mandatory training, uh, a, a, a government petition um, to campaign for mandatory training for, for NHS staff. And we supported Paula in that campaign. So our policy and public affairs team coached Paula in, uh, in engaging uh, MPs. And we also supported her petition through our channel. So it was really important that Paula was the voice of the campaign and that we didn't take over, um, but that we supported Paula and her efforts in any way that we could. Um, Mencap also played a really key role in consultation, particularly in the pre-consultation. So we have a, a steering group made up of people with learning disabilities who make key decisions about our Treat Me Well campaign. And the steering group, um, uh, the government, the Department of Health and Social Care, um, came and spoke to the steering group about the consultation and that shaped some of the consultation questions. So they were really integral to that. And this is a quote um, from a partner organization here about the campaign pervading uh, the system in an incredibly positive way. So that's, that's the mandatory training ask. Um, really, you know, in terms of uh, creating that system change, Training all NHS staff is a, those a significant way to addressing some of those uh, issues around attitudes which contribute to early and avoidable deaths. So, as I said, um, Paula McGowan was very much the face of the campaign and she told the story of uh, her son and how she told the story of her son. She didn't talk about his death. She talked about his life, which was incredibly powerful and emotive and really engaged um, decision makers in her cause. 
Um, and they really respected Paula for the story that she had to tell. And that was really important. And as I said, as that quote shows, we weren't the face of mandatory training. It was very much Paula. We gave her the space um, to be the face. And we supported her in any way that she wanted us to support her. So going on to November 2019. Okay. Um, so in 2019, just before uh, COVID hit, uh, the government uh, committed to mandatory training for all healthcare, uh, health and social care um, staff. Um, so that's over three million staff, three and a half million staff who uh, will be trained in, in, in learning disability awareness, which was a huge, huge success for the campaign. And I, I noted uh, Zubeda's um, point earlier about um, kind of some of these campaigns, you know, come out of, you know, we talk about campaign wins and campaign successes, but they come out of truly awful and tragic circumstances. So, you know, we shouldn't really have to be campaigning around these issues, but, um, but uh, we do have to. So, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's definitely something that we're, we're very conscious of, of uh, being very sensitive to. So, but we, we managed to, to uh, that was a successful campaign for us. And then in the spring of 2020, obviously uh, the pandemic hit and uh, people with learning disabilities were disproportionately impacted by, by COVID uh, and died at six, over six times the rate of the general population. So it really emphasised the point about um, uh, the inequalities that people with learning disabilities face in the health system. It shone a light on those health inequalities. And some of those uh, issues, um, you know, kind of were around uh, blanket, do not resuscitate notices being applied to people's records, uh, visitor bans, uh, people weren't allowed uh, in ambulances to support people um, who were going into hospital, people weren't allowed to support people in, in the hospital. Um, and that created issues around communication, which um, has a, a negative impact on, on people's health outcomes because they cannot uh, communicate um, in an accessible way. Uh, health, healthcare professionals cannot communicate in, in an accessible way. And we also learned that uh, some learning disability nurses were redeployed with, within the hospital um, and therefore were not um, available to support people with learning disabilities. Uh, there was a rollback of reasonable adjustments and people with a learning disability weren't prioritised for the COVID vaccine. And this launched our campaign to prioritise uh, the, the vaccine for people with learning disabilities, building on all of the evidence that we had built during the pandemic. We launched our, our um, report into the barriers that people with learning disabilities faced during the pandemic, um, which highlighted some case studies and stories of people's experiences, as well as some um, evidence um, uh, and, and research around the impact of, of COVID on, on health outcomes. And we use this as a launching pad to campaign for, um, for, for, back, for people with learning disabilities to be prioritised for the COVID vaccine. It was a multifaceted campaign uh, involving uh, many different uh, strands and uh, teams from within MENCAP. And we also engaged external stakeholders. So building on what I said earlier about building relationships with, with decision makers, it was really important. We actually entered the, 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 the campaign in a really, um, the, the pandemic in a really strong position because uh, we had already built up a lot of those relationships. So this is a bit of an alphabet spaghetti soup of, um, of different stakeholders, but we had built up really good relationships with the Department of Health and Social Care, for example, and NHS England, um, and with, with Public Health England. And the, the primary aim of the uh, vaccine campaign was to make the vaccine a political issue and not a scientific issue. So uh, the government deferred to the JCVI uh, for their advice around uh, the, the vaccine and 
we wanted to put it on the and the JCVI did not prioritize people with with learning disabilities and um, we wanted to use the evidence that we had <clears throat> pulled together to show that actually there was a political case for prioritizing people with a learning disability so we mobilized our supporters to 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 lobby their mp and to tell their story which was really important so um, we had over 9,000 people take that action, which had a huge impact. And we gained lots of coverage in, in, in the media. Um, and we also worked with lots of uh, influencers. So we always try to put people um, with lived experience front and centre of our campaigns as spokespeople. Um, but we also had a lot of support from, from Joe Wiley, uh, who, who was a DJ. Uh, Radio 2G DJ, whose uh, sister has a learning disability and wasn't prioritised, um, and she became a very vocal advocate and we supported her in her campaign in a similar way to the way we supported uh, Paula McGowan as well. And then in February uh, 2021, uh, we learned that people with a learning disability um, were to be prioritised. But that didn't end the campaign. We also worked with uh, local groups um, to uh, uh, advocate for them to be put on the learning disability register. So the learning disability register was a pathway to the vaccine. Um, and uh, there was a lot of uh, there is a lot of ignorance around the learning disability register and uh, what a learning disability is, and so we worked with a lot of local campaigners to um, advocate for um, people locally to be put on the learning disability register so that they would qualify for the vaccine. So just in summary, our COVID response, uh, we, we had a really nimble strategic approach. Um, and as I said, the strength of uh, our evidence base led to two policy wins. So one was the revoking of do not resuscitate notices. Um, and then the second one was around prioritizing vaccinations for people with a learning disability. Um, and the other key kind of element, I guess, to, to draw out of this campaign is that we had really strong relationships with, with key decision makers. Um, and as I said, we were seen as having the finger on the pulse in relation to our pandemic campaigning, um, which helped us, you know, kind of shift the dial on, um, on uh, the, 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 the vaccine um, um, and prioritization of people with learning disabilities for the vaccine. So that is uh, everything uh, from me. Uh, I, I think I'm slightly over time, so apologies. Um, but I, over to Emma. Thank you ever so much, Paul. Um, it, that was really um, informative and, and great to have such um, uh, strong examples around local campaigning and around in how individuals can make a difference because I think um, it can feel very overwhelming um, uh, at times um, in the current environment so so thank you for that we have got a few questions um, already come up um, so one of them Paul was if um, you were able to share the powerpoint um, is that okay? If you share it with me, what I'll do is I'll send it out to people. Um, if that's okay, I'll put it on that's a PDF. Fine. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, Brilliant. Thank you. Um, and um, uh, a couple of um, uh, other questions. So um, from Liz. Liz, do you want to, to, to speak the question or should I speak it on your Yeah, I, I can speak the question. Um, it's simply that the figure of six times more deaths was mentioned a lot, Paul, and I'd love to know the source of that figure. So where did that statistic come from? So we pulled, we, we, we pulled statistics from various different sources. Um, the, the, that statistic, I think, came from the, uh, from, from the ONS. Um, but I can, I, what I can do is I can get the exact reference for all of those statistics, include them as a footnote in the presentation when I circulate it. 
That'd be fantastic. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Um, we've got a, a couple of questions from Geeta. Um, Geeta, are you there? Would you like to, to ask them? Yes, it was to Tofun Me. Tofun Me, can you see the chat? I mean, I basically said, um, you know, I'm not sure how long you've been going, but one of the things that's really important to show is what are the outcomes of the work that you do for the individuals that you work with? because that's about building the case, you know, for success for yourselves in terms of funding for the future and health services and, you know, uh, and, and, and other people as well. Um, yeah, so we do, of course, we love feedback surveys at BLAM for everything we do. We even ask five-year-olds <laughs> if they like our sessions. Um, yes, we do keep feedback. The primary thing that seems to be, uh, that emerges is, it's kind of the first time for many of them as individuals of feeling seen and understanding that a lot of other people, basically the wider black community are dealing with the things that they are dealing with and also walking away and leaving with actual practicable tools that can help them navigate being one of three black people working in um, a kind of an office space. So that is something, the work that we do at BLAM is very community centered. So. Um, it's not necessarily always our final goal to um, lobby the government because we have a lot of issues with institutions um, as an organization and the ways in which they work and how you kind of sometimes have to um, de-radicalize the things that you're working on when you do become a part of those institutions. Um, I guess a high level thing that we do work on and that we are more generally working on is maybe developing training that um, will help um, therapists kind of incorporate that kind of African-centered um, work into their practice. But the reality is at this point in time, one thing that's definitely been expressed. So our Zuri Wellness is not run by a mixed bag of people. It's run exclusively only by black therapists and particularly black therapists who work around kind of racial wellness and racial trauma issues. So unfortunately our goal isn't necessarily to scale up to the NHS because the reality is there's not that many black therapists that work within the NHS and that would need to fundamentally change before we could actually put our sights on ensuring. And I think until there's at least that minimum, then it can be, okay, how can maybe white practitioners and practitioners of other races kind of incorporate? But as of now, even a, a friend kind of as a personal anecdote, who's a Muslim woman has made the choice to find a therapist who is a Muslim woman. I think that something maybe needs to shift in therapy that understands that even if you are maybe culturally and racially aware and have that background and knowledge, you're maybe not still necessarily the right person for your patient to approach for that sort of support. But anecdotally, we always, we genuinely, we always receive positive feedback. We sometimes put some of the things on social media. Some people have made, have written part of our therapy as we do a bit of poetry therapy, have written really powerful therapy, um, or sorry, powerful poems post kind of the Zuri Wellness sessions, just talking about the experience because I think it can be very isolating, particularly if you have grown up or you're living in a more predominantly white area or even within um, black communities sometimes mental health as we know is not always discussed so yeah. having that kind of is for us that is more than enough personally yeah. yeah yeah I think you're doing fantastic work thank you very much to fund me thank you for the question Gita, did you have some other questions for Paul as well yes Paul when you were talking about the training that you did for staff you talked about it in terms of just before lockdown. So everybody scrambled at that time that was doing face-to-face -face delivery of training. You know, how do we make it um, sort of just as vibrant, just as good and make it online? So I don't know whether that happened for you. So with, with, with the training, <clears throat> that then entered, uh, when we were successful in that, um, we that uh, entered into another phase where uh, we worked with um, Health Education England mm -hmm. to, we were one of a, a, a group of consortia who were uh, piloting the training. Um, and uh, that, that was piloted throughout last year. So the pilots actually completed 
in uh, November of last year. Um, and, and now it's being, those pilots are being evaluated with the idea that it will be, um, um, by the end of this year, it will start to be rolled out um, across, across the country. Um, but um, we, we were very um, forthright in our view that the training needed to be co-delivered by people with lived experience. So we were, um, we felt that um, an online training wouldn't be adequate and that actually people's um, unconscious biases are challenged mm -hmm. when they meet people with, with, with lived experience face to face who are talking about their experience of health inequalities. So it was very important for us um, to make that key feature of the uh, training that we delivered. Other organizations in other consortia delivered, uh, delivered online training and that, that is being evaluated. But we were very, um, as I said, you know, we were very um, clear on um, saying that this, this, this needs to be delivered, co-delivered by people with lived experience. And that was a real challenge Mm -hmm. during covid mm -hmm. during the last year because of lockdown but uh you know we couldn't get rooms and you know kind of you know you know, kind of people you know it was challenging to get people you know kind of just to sign up but um we 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 persisted with it and we got an extension mm -hmm. as well to to um the, the pilots in order to accommodate those those asks but mm -hmm. that is that's really important important for us but there are things you know in terms of like we, we've worked for example with a um with a learning disability uh, theater company to uh, create some films and videos uh for us around um uh, uh, like scenarios uh around around health and social care treatment um which you know can be used online and, mm -hmm. and offline and face-to-face training. So we've done some really creative things to try and um, you know, kind of bring to life the issues that people people face and, and, and you know, kind of the barriers that they, that they face. Thank you. Paul, I think the main point I'm making is that this can be a tool that you can use in so many ways. I mean, we're members of local groups, and if we wanted to raise awareness using some of the materials that you've developed, then that's something I think that can go wider in the community, um, apart from health and social care staff. So you've done it with health staff, but maybe not with social care staff. But I suppose I'm saying that it, it could ac actually have much wider application. I will take that back, Peter. Mm. And yeah, <laughs> we have yeah, and we I'm... have done we have done some some of the training internally as well with yeah. our own staff. Yeah. yeah, that's a really good point. And we do have we, we do also sorry very quickly. I realize you've got to go. We do also have a whole range of accessible resources as well, which we develop for people with learning disabilities around a range of issues. So it's really important that all of our communications and all of our resources are inclusive. And, as, uh, and and accessible. So we, we, we produce a lot of our, our resources and we'll be producing a lot of our campaigning resources in the future um, uh, that are accessible for, for people with, with, with a learning disability. Thank Sorry, you. Anna. That's okay, thank you. It's, it's um, really, it's great that people are engaged when, and um, wanting to, to uh, to ask these really useful questions. Um, apologies, um, uh, I have had a couple more questions, but we are running low on time. Um, so I am going to um, just move forward, just in terms of um, what people can do on, on, on an individual level and on a local level. Um, so I'm going to pass over to our, our, our communications officer, Cerise. Therese, are you there? I am here. Therese, are you okay to talk through um, yes. the next I'm few slides? Yes, I'm not sure if people can see me because I can't see myself. But hi everyone, I am the Senior communication, Media and Communications Officer at the Equality Trust. Um, so 
obviously you've heard from some incredible speakers and you probably are thinking what can I do and how can I get involved um so there's a range of things that you can do um obviously we put a few on the slide um so like whether you want to contact radio or press social media um local newspapers um and if I mean, you go onto the next slide, I can just go into a bit more detail. So you can do different actions. So one of them could be contacting your local MP or assembly. So either write into your MP slash assembly representative on the issue of health inequalities in your local area um, can also can be an impactful tool to raise the key issues um, of importance to you, um, to your representative in um, so they can represent you in UK Parliament. Um, they there is a link which Emma will share after this to local health which helps you pull any data on your um, local community or local area so you can actually have access to them um, and then another option is you can write a letter to local press and um, if you'd like to raise an issue with the press you can um, either write to the editor um, or they will normally have like an, a submissions um, email that you can submit um, comment pieces to. Um, you can reshare any of the Equality Trust infographics and um, posters or anything that we put up on social media or sign up to our um, newsletter. Um, if we have any um, campaigns or if we're doing anything to share around health inequalities or any other um, topics, you can always reuse them and repurpose them on your social media. You can also come together in local groups. So obviously we have a range of local groups that are affili affiliated with us, which you can visit on our website. Um, or you can come together in your community um, to organise small positions um, or collate first-hand stories to share with local decision makers and um, or team up with other local groups. Um, that aren't just in your community but want to raise awareness of health inequalities. And then the next slide is um, the Equality Trust. We would really like to amplify the voices, which Sabeda said, of people with lived experience. Um, so what we are hoping to pilot is um, getting submissions of people with um, experience of health inequalities and pulling them together into a video that we can then use to um, raise awareness on social media or if, whether we um, build it into some sort of report but if you are happy to you can always contact me my email is there and I will copy and paste it into the chat also um, you can also share your experience in a blog um, or a video or any form of um, communication that you think is best for you whether you want to do audio um, it's completely up to you and we can share that on our everyday inequality platform or you can share it on your own social media and just use the hashtag hashtag everyday health inequality or hashtag everyday inequality um, so that's some ways that you can some things that you can do next and um, so there's some useful resources so um, a healthy economy needs healthy people and um, that's a link that you can go to um, you can also um, visit IPPR um, and then there's some more links as well um, of different areas so the first one is the inequalities in health alliance um, king's fund the running me trust and the institute of health equity the health foundation and then obviously the last one is the link that you can go to to find out information on health inequalities in smaller areas or local areas to you so Hi, thank you so much, Sarisa. Sorry, sorry, I had to race through that. Um, okay.